Good morning, everyone. First, I want to thank everyone who participated in cleanup day on Saturday. There were a lot of volunteers uh, helping out across the state. Over 500 signed up, and there were hundreds more that joined on their own. So far, we know over 100,000 pounds of debris was collected on Saturday, and that number will continue to grow as reports come in. Organizing the event uh, on just a couple of weeks notice took a lot of hard work, so I want to thank Green Up Vermont, uh, their local coordinators, Ernie Bach at uh, New England Subaru, and all their partners uh, for their support. From what I saw working on a couple of projects in Barrie myself, and what I hear from people around the state is there's still a lot of work left to do. So it's not over and we'll continue to need volunteers and efforts like this uh, to get us through uh, the next uh, couple of months. For example, I've seen and already heard uh, about the many tires uh, amongst the debris. So Wheels for Warmth will be collecting tires on Saturday, September 16th from eight to four at the Granite Museum in Barrie. If you've collected tires as a result of the flood, please bring them down on the 16th and we'll dispose of them at no charge. But I wanna be clear, this is for flood tires only. We will not be collecting tires for the traditional Wheels for Warmth program on September 16th. That will happen later in October. I know for many, especially in areas that weren't impacted, the July floods are a thing of the past. But we have to remember, there are still thousands of Vermonters and employers living with the consequences every single day. They're still mucking out their homes, repairing damage, and searching for funding so they can pay their bills and rebuild their lives. Many are still worried about the basics, like whether the furnace will fire up in time for winter, which is right around the corner. That's why this response and recovery continues to be the primary focus for me, my team, municipalities, charitable organizations, both our congressional delegation and local leaders, and will be for many, many months ahead. Debris cleanup <clears throat> continues to be a high priority for the SEOC, and uh, Commissioner Morrison will have an update in a few minutes. We all have to stay focused on debris, debris removal, and here's why. Uh, we only have to look at what the storms are bringing us today uh, as an example. But we're watching also in real time as Hurricane Adelia is hitting Florida. We're reminded that hurricane season is here and could impact us with more rain in the coming weeks. One of the biggest concerns, and again, uh, we can see this happening in real time, when it comes to flooding happens when culverts, bridges, catch basins, and other structures become obstructed with debris and are still obstructed as a result of the flooding. That's why all of us, from the state to municipalities, need to make cleaning debris a priority to reduce flooding impacts over the next few months. Another priority is making sure those who suffer damage get as much funding as possible to recover. So we need Vermonters and municipalities to know we're coming up on deadlines to apply for FEMA support. So please, please don't wait. Get your applications and information into FEMA now before it's too late. If you've already applied and believe you should get more, you can and should appeal to FEMA. That's also the case if your costs have increased since you made your original claim. I know there are a lot of questions about this process and General Roy will have more to say on that uh, in a few minutes. Lastly, uh, Secretary Curley will report on BGAP, the Business Assistance Program. I've run into a few business owners over the last couple of weeks who still aren't aware of this opportunity. So it's important if you suffer damage as a business, please apply to this simple process. So. We continue to try to get the word out. If your business, again, was impacted by the flooding, please apply. There's still capacity, and I know every bit can help. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor, and good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here to help us get important information out to the public. 
My remarks will focus on debris management. Flood debris continues to be a major focus for the state and municipalities. Cities and towns should continue to collect flood debris from rights of way and document the costs for federal reimbursement. Those communities that lack sufficient resources to collect this debris should contact Vermont Emergency Management to arrange for assistance. For over a month, the state has been assisting in cleaning debris from public rights of way. To date, Vermont's debris contractor and the Agency of Transportation have picked up nearly 6,000 tons or 12 million pounds of flood waste from public rights of way. This does not include the considerable efforts of towns and private landowners who have worked with contracted waste haulers themselves. This cleanup has focused first on the hardest hit communities, specifically Montpelier, Barry City, Berlin, Middlesex, Barrytown, Plainfield, Marshfield, Washington, Barton, East Montpelier, and Orange. We are now working in other heavily impacted towns, including East Montpelier, Coventry, Waterbury, Orange, Woodbury, Brandon, and Ludlow. The state is working to ensure that nothing is missed. We're reaching out directly to cities and towns, as well as sending task forces into the field to identify piles that have not been identified by municipalities or by individuals. We have recruited five emergency medical services to scout debris. They report locations to the State Emergency Operations Center for coordination of debris sorting and pickup. These EMS teams have traveled over 3,000 miles of road in 52 flood affected towns and have reported over 144 individual debris piles. We are using this information to determine where to focus further resources. Demolition and other man-made debris is still the highest priority category as it is likely the most dangerous. As we clean up from the July storms, we are keeping our eyes open for other potential problems that could pop up now that hurricane season is entering its busiest month. And we are thinking ahead to spring thawing events. This means that we have to also focus on vegetative and woody debris in and around our waterways. Fortunately, no storms are tracking toward Vermont right now, but even as we clean up from the recent floods, we have to work to mitigate problems that could come up if we should see another extended rain event. This includes clearing trash and vegetative debris from culverts, catch basins, storm water systems, bridge abutments, and rivers. Towns and individuals should also be working now to unblock culverts, empty their catch basins, and clean up jammed bridge abutments. We can't stop the rain, but we can do everything possible to ensure that it goes where it should go. If you have flood-related debris and need assistance removing it, or if you know of someone who does, please report this to your municipal leadership. Likewise, if you know of a clogged catch basin, blocked culvert, or other area of potentially dangerous debris, report it to local officials. The state is prepared to assist with any work that exceeds local resources, but we have to know about the issues in order to give you help. Local officials can contact the State Emergency Operations Center through our watch officer 24 7 365. Thank you very much, and I will turn things over to General Roy. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, I'll be a little longer than normal, I just so I can cover some of the appeals process that the governor asks us we speak to. Um, but before we begin there, uh, even with the severe weather, uh, and we note that uh, during this incident here in Vermont, uh, we've had a number of other national level incidents we've watched, right? Hawaii with the wildfires, uh, California with Hillary, and of course now here uh, today with Adelia. Um, excuse me, one second. The, um, but even so, we still have over 400 uh, FEMA personnel here uh, in Vermont assisting with the recovery. Uh, as of today, we've provided over $16 million uh, to residents impacted by this disaster. $16 million. Uh, if you have not applied for assistance, please do so by visiting disasterassistance.gov. 
or calling us at 1-800-621-3362 or visiting one of our nine disaster recovery centers known as DRCs. I'd like to take a moment to talk about the appeals process uh, for individual assistance. First, carefully read the letter you receive from FEMA. Reading this letter will help you decide what the next steps are. If you do not understand the letter, please visit one of the nine DRCs we have open here in Vermont. FEMA representatives are also making calls to applicants who may need additional information uh, for their case. So far, the team has placed over 5,000 calls, 5,000 calls, and has resulted in an additional $2.6 million provided to residents in Vermont. I say that again, they have called 5,000 of our residents and has resulted in over 2.6 million additional dollars being provided by updating their cases. If an applicant, applicant receives a denial letter or disagrees with a determination from FEMA, they can appeal the decision. Appeals should be uh, made within 60 days of the date of their notification letter. So if they get a letter, it says, hey, you're not eligible for this, or this is how much money we're giving you for your HVAC system, um, and they want to appeal that, they have 60 days from when they get that letter, not from when they, when they first started the process. When they uh, appeal, we look for the documentation to support their appeal. So any receipts that they have, any contractor estimates, uh, or insurance determinations uh, will help us adjust the amount that they're receiving. Uh, and as I said, each eligibility decision has its own 60-day window. So if you're appealing for your HVAC system and you're also uh, requesting additional uh, rental assistance, those are two separate uh, appeals and each of them has their own 60-day window. Uh, importantly, uh, applicants can also submit contractor estimates after the 60-day appeal window. We recognize here in Vermont that access to contractors has, has been very difficult for many of our residents. So they can, as part of the justification process, they can explain why they couldn't get a contractor in there and then submit uh, the updated information from the contractor. The appeals letter uh, must explain the reason for the appeal and must be signed by the applicant themselves or uh, a, the, a person who the applicant uh, authorizes to sign on their behalf. The appeal submission should also include the following information, their full name, the FEMA application number and the disaster number, the address of the pre-disaster residence that was impacted, and then their current phone number and current address. Uh, they can submit these appeals uh, either uploading it at disasterassistance.gov as part of their case, or they can fax it to 1-800-827-8112. Or they can just go to one of the DRCs and our staff there will help them upload their documents. We currently have nine disaster recovery centers still open today. We have one at the Barton Memorial a Building in Barton. We have one at the Springfield Health Center, which closes on the 2nd of September. We have one in the Cabot Town Hall, one at the Armory in Waterbury, one at the Barry Auditorium, one at the Asa Bloomer Building in Rutland. That one closes on the 1st of September. Uh, we have one at the Wardsboro Town Hall, the Vermont College of Fine Arts in Montpelier, in the Northern uh, Vermont University in Johnson. Uh, and then very quickly, I also, also want to talk about direct housing, uh, which has been approved for Lamoille, Washington, and Windsor counties. Uh, for this disaster, solutions can include uh, temporary uh, trans uh, transportable houses, mobile homes, direct lease, in other words, FEMA will find a location for somebody and do a direct lease for them to live in, or we, can, we are searching for multi-family uh, locations that we can lease and repair. So if there is a, a multi-family location that is in disrepair, we can take a look at it and make the repairs, and the repairs we made will count against you know, the lease we'll have, but the lease will be repaired. Um, so we have requests out there uh, via media 
uh, for anybody who has a facility like that they would like us to take a look at. Um, we're currently dealing with about 250 people who are uh, eligible for direct housing. Many of these people have already found their own solutions and don't need FEMA's help, uh, but we still call them and ask them what their, what their goals are uh, and if they need our assistance. So if they're living with a relative and the relative's kind enough with, to put up with them for a couple months, but they realize they need something for a longer period, we'll help them with that. Um, and with that, um, we are also uh, continuing to call uh, these individuals to make sure that their housing condition is, is, is stable. Uh, and if, they, if it changes, they can call us and we can help them with direct housing. Lastly, just a couple of stats we talk about. Still 415 FEMA personnel here in Vermont. We've had 5,449 residents apply for individual assistance. We've approved $16.3 million. Uh, U.S. Small Business Administration uh, has approved over $12, uh, 12 million dollars and provided 267 loans to homeowners, renters, and businesses. I would also note that to date we've had 77 payments uh, dispersed for private bridges and and uh, and um, uh, also 445 payments for road repair for people's driveways. Uh, so those are things that we can help with. I know that's come up in a number of different uh, times. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Curley. Ma'am? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am going to provide another update this morning on our BGAP program, as the governor mentioned. Um, we're really trying to encourage impacted, bu impacted businesses to apply. To date, Almost 600 applications have been formally submitted and 392 are fully complete. So that's up around 50 from last week. 66 are currently being reviewed or are in the queue to be reviewed. 34% are completed and approved for a BGAP grant. A total of $1.8 million in funding has been approved and the average award amount is $13,000. Total damages for the applications that have been submitted is around $138 million. Total net damages, meaning that's deducting insurance and other grants, is about $111 million. We continue to work through the applications and support business owners in getting completed applications into our agency for processing. As a reminder, there are technical assistance resources available to businesses to help them with their application process, and those can be found at accd.vermont.gov. Also, as a reminder, we have a contractor estimator tool that can help businesses estimate their damages if they're unable to get a contractor to visit their place of business. ACCD is also continuing to get the word out about this program. We are aware that there are some business owners who still haven't heard of this program, likely due to the fact that they are so involved in the cleanup process. So we are doubling down on our efforts through our partners to spread the word about this program. The agency is also hearing from businesses that did not suffer physical damage, but did suffer economic harm due to the flooding event. While there is no funding available to address this need at this time, we are collecting data from the business community on any economic harm via a survey. This survey can also be found at the Recovery Resource Center on our website at accd.vermont.gov. Again, this survey is not tied to any specific grant opportunity or funding at this time, but will help us understand the impact of the economic loss to businesses should opportunities arise to advocate for supporting those businesses. I also just want to mention that each week we're seeing news that impacted, adversely impacted businesses are coming back online. And we're really excited and we hope that the deployment of these grants will continue to bring the good news and that we'll continue to see businesses coming online and their doors open. So again, if you know folks that are really busy 
with their cleanup and they haven't had the time to be watching the news or looking on social media, please spread the word about these grants because um, it is our goal to help them restore their businesses and bring their employees back and get their doors open and get our communities back to the vibrancy they were before the storm. So thank you very much. And with that, I think I'm back to the governor. Thank you very much, Secretary Curley. We'll now open up to questions. Governor, you mentioned deadlines to apply for FEMA assistance. What are they? I think they're at different times, maybe. Uh, September 12th, currently, for individual assistance. Are there any um, efforts on behalf of the state to ask to extend those deadlines? We, we have a, uh, we put out a request for a number of different uh, changes, um, I don't know, if Doug, you want to address that right now? Yeah. So we have um, one request pending with FEMA, which could influence this. It's a petition to reconsider the incident period, and we're providing FEMA with supplemental data to support that request. Um, that is in process, uh, and we are will soon, most likely today, be sending a request to extend the IA deadline from September 12th to October 12th, um, primarily because we are seeing communities still trying to work through this process. IA, individual assistance, is relatively new to Vermonters, so we want to uh, request that additional 30 days from FEMA. Okay. And maybe, Will, you might be the best person to answer this. At what point would we hear back um, from FEMA on that request? Well, fortunately, uh, the regional administrator uh, for FEMA Region 1 has delegated that authority to me, so not a lot of levels to go through. Uh, and what we'll look at is, is the, the, uh, the Stafford Act does require us to take a look at, at exceptions uh, and, and what's causing the request to be extended. We recognize that we have three counties that were added on uh, later than others. A lot of people haven't been able to get into their homes uh, because of the floods. Uh, so we took a take a look at all those and, and we'll provide a very prompt response to this, the governor's request. Okay, thank you. While you're up there, Will. Oh, you're I do have one thing to add. Uh, we are also submitting a request to FEMA for an extension to the deadline to submit um, for the August 3rd through August 7th activity as a separate disaster. So because we're petitioning to reconsider the incident period, it would, of course, overlap and impact that uh, disaster period determination on FEMA's part. So that is one, another element that's in play here. You had mentioned, Will, that there are 250 individuals who are eligible for direct housing assistance. Yes, sir. Um, you said you've been in communication with them that not all of them are going to need that support. Approximately how many of those 250 do you anticipate you need to supply housing for? We do have a population under 50 right now that we're working with uh, in the Washington County area. Obviously, the one area that's been impacted most greatly. Um, and so uh, we're working with that population to find opportunities for them. Clearly, in Washington County, uh, specifically Barry, Montpelier, and Berlin, there's not a lot of locations that we can uh, do direct lease in. Uh, not a lot of not a lot of multifamily homes that we can repair, um, and so more than likely we'll end up looking for a location to use for mobile homes uh, to set them up. Uh, so that's where we stand right now. Uh, but we recognize that you know Lamoille County uh, and Windsor also uh, have that opportunity. We're working with them to see if they need assistance. So you're talking about when you say mobile homes, you're talking about FEMA trailers that would be yes, sir, mobile home units, yes, sir. Um, and uh, you also talked about the possibility of rehabbing an existing multifamily structure yes, somewhere. Um, I mean, how far have you gotten in terms of identifying a location? We've, have, we've put out re requests for, uh, uh, for proposals for people to say, hey, I've got this unit here. You know, we'd like you to come take a look at it. Um, we haven't heard much work back at, back at all because there's just not a lot out there. We recognize coming into this storm that the housing was very, very difficult in Vermont as it was, and so there's not a lot of uh, facilities out there for us to do that with. In the mobile home scenario, are you envisioning um, a single plot where many units would be placed? We, we look at group sites as the last option, and so we actually have to execute direct lease and multifamily Re uh, uh, repair and lease um, 
before we go to that uh, that location because obviously it's more costly uh, to the taxpayers right you've got to you've got to find an open site uh, and place them we ideally we would find commercial sites that have open slots again there's not a lot of them around here for us to work with so uh, so once we've exhausted direct lease and the multifamily uh, repair and lease um, that opens up the opportunity for us to do a group sites um, and uh, and so we're actively in anticipation of that looking for locations that we may be able to do that have you identified any uh, there's a, been a couple that have come up that we're getting ready to take a look at, um, but nothing specifically right now. And if, if you think about it, if it's open field, think about all the infrastructure you have. Anybody who's built a house, you know how long it takes to get all the infrastructure in, you know, septic, uh, electricity, roads. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, and winter's coming fast. I believe last week you said, because you still have to build them once they get here, they should be ready by mid to end September. Is that timeline still somewhat accurate, or while you're looking around, could that be delayed? So, so we have, we already have uh, uh, mobile home systems here in Vermont already. Um, now the hard part becomes, right, is finding a location, getting the permits done, putting the infrastructure in place. And, and so we're looking 60 to 90 days before a group site, for instance, would be complete and ready for people to move in. When you say commercial locations, yes, do you mean like uh, parking lots, or what does that mean? I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Commercial parking, uh, per, commercial mobile home uh, locations. Uh, much like you think of Florida, right? You've got a lot of them down there. There's not many, uh, many available uh, in Vermont. Thank you, Governor. As you've probably seen in downtown Montpelier, a lot of businesses are in different stages in their recovery. Some are fully open, some are looking to open by this week. Others really haven't even started the process. Their drywall is still wet and moldy. Um, you know, when you speak with some of them, they, they say, number one, they're looking for either financial help or longer term certainty about flood mitigation in Montpelier, that big existential question. Have you had any conversations about what, what the future of mitigation in Montpelier looks like? Yeah, well, it's it's the whole corridor, if you think about it. Um, when you think about uh, Richmond, Waterbury, Montpelier, Barrie, uh, all the way up to Williamstown, um, it's it's one water system, so to speak. And um, so we're actively uh, pursuing that. We're, we're considering a few options, but those take time. And uh, you can't, uh, that won't happen overnight. Uh, but it's definitely something that's on our mind and we want to mitigate uh, for the future. What, what kinds of options could be on? It's really about the storage uh, capacity from my standpoint. And maybe a hydrologist uh, could talk about this specifically. Um, but from a layman's terms, my perspective, it really is about how do we store water uh, along the way uh, to prevent uh, the massive surge of water all at one time. So what we need to do is uh, go to different areas and create uh, capacity uh, for the stormwater to, to at least uh, stay in one place uh, for a day or two before it's released uh, downstream. So it's, it's a math problem, and, um, and a hydrologist knows this very well. And there's a lot of tributaries that come in uh, to, the, to the main, main rivers, like the Winooski and so forth. So it's, um, it's a giant puzzle. But, um, but it's solvable. It's just going to take a lot of work, a lot of money, um, and some time. Right, because you've got the Dog River, the yeah. Stevens, the, sure. the Winooski. Uh, how, how do you think this, the community, but also the state, should be able to or start wrapping our head around some, some of these costs and, and what, that, what that could look like? Well, again, one, one at a time. Um, it's, it's going to be impacting a number of different communities it's not just this this one happened to impact washington county and has been for a number of storms whether it's again barry or montpelier uh, waterbury and so forth um, but there are other areas of the state and you know remember ludlow um, rodland uh, there are other areas that uh, that need help as well so we have to continue to do whatever we can to, uh, to mitigate the impacts of future flooding that's bound to happen. And just so I'm clear, so you see most of the, the work for Montpelier being upstream, not necessarily in the no, town, th like flood walls or levees or anything? I, yeah, I don't, I don't see that as an option, but uh, again, I'm not an expert in the field. 
uh, but I think it's uh, take the the easiest route first. And when I see both upstream and downstream of Montpelier, I, again, you have to go all the way up back up to to Williamstown at the start, and even into Northfield. I um, mean, start start there and and work your way down. And um, there are a number of areas where we may end up having to create more capacity uh, for the water to store. And I guess the last question on that, the, at some of these Montpelier meetings that the community's been having, some folks have sort of uh, put forth the idea of maybe like a Blue Ribbon Commission or some sort of task force to look into some of these questions. Is, is that on, on your radar? Do you have any plans to maybe put together some I haven't contemplated that. We have a lot of experts uh, in, the, in the field now, and um, we just need to put it into play. So, we'll, I mean, obviously it could be on the table, but, uh, but at this point uh, we just need to get through this recovery stage. Uh, the first, the response, recovery, than mitigation, but we are contemplating all three at once at this point. How worried are you for the economic future of Central Vermont and Montpelier specifically? Obviously, in the near term, many businesses aren't open currently, but I've spoken to people that own buildings along uh, State Street and Main Street saying they don't know if they're going to be able to rent to anybody because they don't know if anyone's going to want to move in or just people that are already there if they're going to open anyway. So. How worried are you for the long term? Yeah, it's always a concern. After um, after Irene, we were concerned. Uh, in, in Waterbury, again, uh, flooding in Montpelier has been uh, happening all too much over the last uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, I've been part of that and been downstream of that with my own business and and uh, and seen it. So we, um, I continue to be concerned about the long term impacts. The Businesses, Main Street businesses in particular, um, are the glue that hold uh, the community together. And uh, we, we are trying to actively pursue uh, alternatives to make sure that we mitigate for the future, uh, but understanding that people are, uh, are uh, concerned about going back there. But, um, but again, so that's why we have to, to contemplate both at the same time. As Calvin mentioned, um, on State Street, Main Street, Montpelier, some businesses are reopening, some not necessarily yet, but some of the state buildings, such as the pavilion where you work out of, still seem like they have quite a bit of time to go in the process. I guess just where do we stand in that? Why are some of these businesses in Montpelier reopening when now we're two-ish or so months down the line and state buildings still are not back online? Well, some of them have different issues. Uh, some of the uh, buildings that we have, 133 state, 109 state, um, we're getting the HVAC systems, electric uh, systems back up in order, and uh, they will be done sooner uh, than like the elevator system. Um, supply chain problems are going to uh, have an impact on, on our reopening of those two facilities, considering the ADA requirements and so forth, and getting our employees back in uh, and making sure that they can get to their offices as well. So uh, we, um, we have you know, our continuing uh, operations plan uh, that we put into place. Uh, so uh, the good news is uh, most uh, agencies and departments have a place to go. We came here and, uh, and it's worked out well. So uh, we can work from anywhere. Uh, it may not be ideal, but, uh, but we need to keep, make sure the wheels of government are continuing to turn and we're taking care of our Vermonters uh, in the process. Three question followed up by a mitigation policy question. So, uh, propane and kerosene tanks, I sure saw a lot of them going down to Stevens Brook in Berlin. Uh, any numbers on just how many tanks were carried away by the floods? Is it in the thousands? Uh, any sense of damage caused? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of damage cause, and I don't know as it got up to the thousands, but uh, I might ask. That's not a number we have at the ready. I'm not sure we have it at all, but we can look into it. And I'm just wondering, just from a flood damage mitigation perspective, would it make sense to lay very natural gas pipelines from Route 7 up to Lamoille and Winooski River basins? To reduce pollution and loss of services caused by could be caused by propane kerosene tank damage. So it just as a 
lines, you know, bury the lines. Less, less budget. Yeah. Um, well, certainly, uh, sometimes uh, burying utility lines makes sense, uh, but it's also very expensive. And uh, we saw how long it took uh, to bring natural gas into Addison County, for instance. Uh, that would be years, years away. Uh, but um, and we're moving in other directions as well, uh, more electrical upgrades and so forth. So. Again, everything should be considered, but that's a, a, a long-term approach uh, to trying to mitigate some of the damage that we've seen. Um, you mentioned the critical importance of debris removal earlier, and I know that the Department of Environmental Conservation has submitted an application to a federal agency. I'm not even going to try to remember what it is. It's got like eight names. Um, but I'm wondering to what extent the cleanup along river corridors uh, is going to be on hold until the feds let us know whether they're going to help. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we have enough uh, to do right now with just getting to the, uh, the bridge infrastructure, uh, the culverts and so forth that are within the right of way of our state and municipal highways. Uh, that will keep us busy for quite some time. Even the storm infrastructure, if you think about it, I would imagine with the amount of rain we just had over the last couple of hours in this region, uh, and we've heard uh, that there's flooding in Ripton, there's a little bit of flooding in Montpelier, there's a little bit of flooding in Barrie. And a lot of that is uh, due to the silt that's built up in the catch basins and the storm infrastructure. So getting that cleaned out is going to be critical as we move forward. So it's, it's not just the debris we're seeing, uh, you know, it's visible uh, in, the, in the river corridor, uh, but but trying to get to the culverts first, making sure that we're getting those cleaned out and debris uh, out from underneath um, bridges and bridge infrastructure and, and the, the stuff we don't see, the silt in uh, the storm infrastructure is going to be critical that we vacuum that out. And that takes a lot of, a lot of time and the appropriate equipment. So we, uh, we again want to encourage municipalities if they're challenged in doing so or reaching out to them as well we, we want to get the resources we need. And if we have to go outside the state to get that, uh, we will. And because that's going to be critical uh, for not only right now, uh, but the next few weeks and into the spring uh, when we have spring, uh, spring thaw and ice and so forth. So it all has to work together. And we don't have much time, but we have to, to focus on that. So just getting that debris cleaned up around in our right of ways is going to be enough. And I'm not, uh, I'm not sure about the other portion uh, in the, on the river corridors uh, that uh, you're speaking about, uh, but that might be maybe Army Corps of Engineers. I'm not sure, but we can look into that. When you say that vacuuming the silt out takes a long time, do you mean weeks or months or months? months. I mean, it's if you take a, you may have witnessed it even in Montpelier when there's a. Uh, blockage and you think about those catch basins that, that uh, with the grates on top and you have silt in them and there, some of them are down eight feet um, so you have a, a giant vacuum truck a vacuum cleaner that sucks all that out well it takes time to do that but then that's only part of it right because the pipe infrastructure that leads from one case catch basin to another is also full of silt so then you have to you have to go down through them. So it's a, it takes a long time uh, to get through and clean out a whole storm infrastructure in a, in a community. And some communities don't have the infrastructure needed uh, to accomplish that. So again, um, for those small communities like whether it's Worcester or Moortown or Plainfield, they don't have a vac truck. Um, so we have to get a commercial service to do that and there's just not enough around and the workforce challenges we already face. So again, this is something that we want to focus on, debris removal, and, and that's included in that debris removal. It might be a dumb question, but are you able to do that in the winter or with yeah, the ground? Not a, not a dumb question. You can do it because um, um, it's not as convenient, but you can continue to do it because it's below ground. And as long as uh, the, the cold air doesn't get to it, and, uh, and it freezes, uh, then you can continue to get it. But 
it would be much better if we could get it before the ground thaws, but I don't imagine we'll get everything by that by that time. Do you know how many people have ordered license plates at this stage? Uh, we had, uh, I've only heard the numbers over the first day. Um, it was significant. Um, I think it was maybe a couple thousand in the first day. So I, I don't have an up-to-date number, but we can get that. Are you doing a uh, big run, production run, or producing as the we're, order? We're, we're trying, I mean, we have, we've done a run, um, and I don't know how many thousand that is, uh, but uh, we will continue to monitor that and reorder as necessary. And how much do they cost to make? Um, they are, uh, I think, to make their five dollars. Are there still socks left? <laughs> I, I don't have the answer to that. Yes, yes, I'm getting the thumbs up in the back row. <laughs> yes, there are socks still available, but you can only order three, I think, uh, three orders. Sorry, three. I'm sorry. You can only order three. Three, three pairs. Three. Governor Peter also mentioned funding for FEMA. As you know, Congress is going to be coming back. They've got spending bills they have to work through. There are some folks in Congress which are now kind of saying, oh, there might be a government shutdown. If we do have one, how would that impact our response? Well, again, when, you're, when you see the impacts of these storms uh, in the regions of our, of our country, uh, the red states, blue states, and so forth, they affect us all. I can't imagine that they wouldn't find a way uh, to fund uh, the, re the request from FEMA to get through this. These are, these are important uh, needs for our citizens and um, probably a better question for them. Uh, but from my standpoint, I, c I can't imagine that they would allow something like that to happen when so many people are suffering at this point in time. You mentioned last week um, trying to undertake some sort of measure to boost Workforce capacity in the trades. Um, any meaningful action on that front at this stage? I mean, do you have a, something you're working on? That you yeah, I mean, we, we continue to, I mean, we've been working on that for a number of years. Um, but the problem is, obviously, is we don't have the people. We, we our, our demographics have shifted. We have, we're getting older. We don't have as many youth. So we don't even have the youth to train. And that's why I keep advocating for we have to make Vermont more affordable to attract more people here um, because it's preventing people from moving to Vermont to live. And um, so I'll continue to make the case. Uh, but, um, but it's a supply and demand issue. It's pretty basic. And we don't have the supply. We have the demand. We don't have the supply. You talked about figuring out what to bring retired workers yeah. back into the fold. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we uh, reached out um, and have, have tried to advocate for people. We've had a little bit of success, but not a lot, um, unfortunately. I know we still have a lot going on in the state, but are there any plans to send, whether it is maybe urban rescue teams down to states affected by Adalia as people came up here and helped us going yeah, through if, our Yeah, if requested, we would, we would be there and try and honor those requests. Got a few on the phones. We'll go to next. We'll start with Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Ed? No questions today. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, the AP. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Um, this is a question for, I have a couple of questions for General Roy. Um, I'm wondering how how many homes are com are considered completely destroyed by by FEMA, and how many have had major damage, and then sort of how how much money is going into those two pots from FEMA? I don't have the exact numbers for for uh, major damage and destroyed because we're still gathering data. Um, um, as we receive, you know, contracts uh, of, of estimates for repair and so forth, um, we can get that to you. Uh, but I don't have that number right off the top of my head. Um, the second question was the funding available. Um, the funding, you know, the administration uh, has stated that we still have funding available and will continue to fund all uh, necessary requirements for helping individuals who have been impacted by disasters. So how much of that $16 million 
went for our individual assistance. Okay, all, all of it. $16 million was all individual assistance. Oh, I see, okay. Um, and, that's all right. that's, uh, then, and that's broken up between uh, housing assistance and then another category called other needs assistance, so things within okay. your home. Um, and the preponderance I of see. it has gone to housing assistance. Okay. Um, all right, uh, so should I just email Jason or? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. All right, back to the room. Can I go off topic? Um, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you received names yet from the Franklin County Democrats? I have not. Okay. Do you know about when you will? I don't know. I would say um, over the next 30 days, um, but stay tuned on that. Uh, we may have some news for you in the next few days um, in terms of maybe appointing an interim. Okay. Okay. Um, do you think Sheriff Grismore should step down at this point, or do you think the impeachment committee should continue with its activity? Um, I didn't believe that the sheriff, uh, I th thought he should have stepped down before he was elected. At this point in time, he's been elected. Uh, they've, uh, they've decided to, to go ahead with the impeachment proceedings, and they should proceed. Thank you all very much.